five. Yay. Cool. All right, so I have a few announcements. Uh, so the big announcement is that we have over 100 subscribers to our YouTube channel now, which means that I could give it a vanity URL. So it is now officially youtube.com slash milehighgophers. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. Uh, some other announcements. There's a few conferences coming up that I just want folks to be aware of. Gotham Go is April 12th, and it's in New York. Uh, up in Toronto, there's GoCon Canada, May 31st, and then, of course, the big GopherCon is going to be July 24th to the 27th, and that's in San Diego this year, not in Denver, so just be aware. And then on that note, uh, I had someone reach out to me about uh, GopherCon in Europe. Uh, they haven't given me a code yet, but they said they'd give us a discount code if anybody was interested. What? I know! That's, that's in the Canary Islands, that's like a GoCon EU, yeah. It's, but yeah, that'd be a cool if you wanted to reach out to me on Meetup, I am forbidden from sharing it on social media. So, if they give me the code, I can happily share it, but you have to reach out. Was that because we're part of the uh, Go network now? Maybe that's what it was? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Alright. Uh, I think that's it for announcements. Anything <coughs> else now? Okay. How's it for me? Cool. So tonight uh, we have a guest speaker, Mike Riedel. He is a principal software engineer at Comcast Viper. Uh, so he'll be talking tonight about some lesser known encoding packages in the standard library, particularly ASM.1 and GOB, which I'm really interested in. So uh, without further ado, go ahead and take it away. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm Mike, and uh, when, as, as I'm going through the talk, if you have any questions and you don't mind your voice being on the uh, on the internet, just you know, jump in. Uh, no question is too simple or too naive or whatever you might think it is. So I know we have some beginners in the room, so don't be shy, and feel free to ask questions or uh, get clarifications or or what have you. So <clears throat> we're going to be talking about the other encoding packages in uh, in um, in the GoCern library, you know, we're all very familiar with JSON and uh, XML and then our, our, our friend YAML, which we don't have a standard package for that yet in the in standard library, but you know, there's, there's all kinds of encoding packages that we are already familiar with because we use them all the time. They're kind of the lingua franca of the internet at large, right? Um, so here we're going to go into some other ones with, uh, with a bit of history around them and, um, and some pretty interesting things that go along with them. So. Let's get let's dig in. So we're going to be talking about ASN.1. So it's an encoding slash ASN1, and then GOB uh, encoding slash GOB. Uh, and we're going to be comparing them against some of our more well-known encoding uh, packages. So I guess the big question is why is binary encoding so important, right? So everything we do. Um, in order to transmit data and have things that are viewable and incomprehensible to us bags of water, uh, we need to translate the zeros and the ones into things that we can understand, right? So everything has a, a binary coding because computers store in binary, then we need to read them. So um, our character sets, like 7-bit ASCII, which is really old, and 8-bit ASCII, which is not that old, and then we have our new um, newer UTF-8 and 16, and then if you want to go really old school, you have um, EBCDIC encoding from the old mainframes. Uh, that's the courtesy of IBM back in the 60s. Thank you. Um, uh, floating point numbers are also stored in binary encoding, and if you wanted uh, a great cure for insomnia is the IEEE 754 um, RFC for floating point numbers and how all the weird edge cases that go into encoding floating point numbers and then uh, doing the things with them. So. And then also binary coding of structured data is a great way to save time and space when we don't have to read the data ourselves, when we're just transmitting data between computers or, or machines. Uh, we can encode things in a machine independent way. Uh, that way we don't have to send massive amounts of data across. We can encode it up and then ship it off. So we're going to start uh, off with a uh, quick thing. Sure. Um, which, which one are you getting? I think it's showing the. Logo. Some of the DTC folks are just uh, okay. not seeing your slides. So oh, no. Try and fix it here. Sure. There we go. 
Is it good? Yeah. Cool. All right. We're going to dig into ASN that one first. So we're going to go from ancient history to modern history here in, in, in our two topics for tonight. So ancient history with ASN that one. So ASN that one, for those who haven't heard of this, uh, is a very, very, very old a telecom a spec. Uh, it became a standard in the 80s. 84. Uh, it's an ISO IEC spec. It's also an ITU uh, spec, or what they call uh, ITU. They don't have specs. They have uh, recommendations. That's right. Um, it's a uh, it's an IDL style language. So those of you who uh, had to suffer through the Java Corba years, where you wrote your IDLs and you wrote your IDL to J. Uh, to generate your stubs and you have to implement the stubs. So that's that's kind of where we're at with, with ASM.1, right? Um, it describes an interface in serialization format of data, of a data structure that is passed between systems in a, in a very um, machine independent way. Um, the actual language for defining um, your ASN, your ASN.1 IDLs are very human readable. It's a, it's a, it's a very approachable syntax for you know, compared to other languages I've used. Um, it's used in a bunch of places that we, I mean, like we, we use ASN.1 every day because it's part of the um, X509 encryption, the key, uh, the key, the key sharing. Uh, it's part of cellular technology and networking technology. It's how cryptography works, right? You, they encode the, the uh, certs and everything else in uh, ASN.1. So if you use LDAP, Voice over IP, SNMP, a cell phone, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, HTTPS, then you use ASN.1. It's buried many layers deep, but it's there. Uh, there's a couple of first, um, it's, it's a first class structure uh, in three different languages, uh, SDL, which I've never heard of, uh, and, um, and also for in a TTCN3, which I've never heard of either, and then Erlang, which we've all kind of heard of, but I've yet to meet anyone who actually wrote code in it, uh, except for one guy at work. Um, so yeah, uh, you can actually write ASN.1 in your Erlang system in its first class. That's kind of neat. Um, getting into kind of the structure of things. So you have to define your IDL and then compile it, and then you know, um, then your Go program can you know read it. There's no Go. Uh, stub generator or I, or IDL compiler for ASN.1. Um, I'm just going to I'm, I'm just going to go through how the how you you would define it if you're starting off, you know, writing a system that uses ASN.1. <clears throat> so our keywords are all caps. Yay! Like we're yelling code. Um, no underscores. Uh, you know, the assignment is very go-like with the colon, except, except it's two colon equal instead of a single colon equal, right? Um, they have these interesting kind of data types for uh, strings. So you can define a string with an IA5 string, which is the international alphabet number five, which is a uh, seven bit ASCII. So it's um, in, in the US, it would be seven bit ASCII. They also support UTF strings. They support this notion of what's called a visible string, which is Seven bit ASCII minus all the control characters, so no control, no uh, character return or, or new line or anything like that, or bell, ASCII bell, um, things like that. You can also encode uh, binary and hex strings by quoting them using the ticks, then putting a B or an H after them. <clears throat> and then you can define your data structures using kind of the uh, in the black box here. We're defining a card data structure and it has a brand, a color, and an age. Right, and that's how you define a data structure is by saying, "Hey, this thing is a sequence of these things." Right? Um, there's a corollary to sequence called set. Um, the difference between set and sequence is sequences are like uh, GoLang structs, right? Where the order of the thing, the order of the members in that struct is how they'll be serialized and written to memory and things like that. So you can be kind of. Um, I know Bill Kennedy has this word for it. You're sympathetic to the machine. I think is what his phrase is, right? Where, you know, if you're if you have a data structure that's laid out with integers and strings, you want to put your integers first because they're fixed width, and then you put your string at the end. That way, the the compiler and the runtime can lay them out in memory faster, and you can retrieve them faster. You'll get more cache lines, hits, and all other fun stuff, right? So sequence in ASM.1 is like that, right? Where it's they're defined in a set 
in a set sequence, right? There's also a set which you can define a car as a set of attributes also, but the ordering of the attributes is kind of YOLO, right? Um, there's also the sequence of and set of uh, things, um, the keywords where you can define a, they're kind of a correlated to uh, a slice or an array. So a sequence of things is an ordered array of, of the same thing, right? So a garage is a sequence of cars. It can also be a set of cars, but um, but set, but the keyword set and set of really aren't used a whole lot in ASM. That one from what I was, from my research that I did. Uh, uh, sure, yeah. So you mentioned putting your integers in fixed width data uh, first. Is that because strings are variable width and you have to? Yeah, they can be. Them? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like that tends to be like, kind of like the the thing that you want to do when you're doing like go structs or C structs yeah. or things like that. So yeah. So does that apply to this like struct that here with? The integer being on the bottom. It doesn't really see. So, so yeah, I mean, this is a this is a counter example, I guess. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is literally a copy pasta from a, from a, a tutorial I went through. Uh, I, I'm not sure with, since this is defined and then you compile it into something. The compiler may change the layout of things. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I haven't played around with it that much. So because cool. it really it's it's yeah. I have a few other questions since I sure yeah. The um, wire up yeah. So you uh, mentioned in the other slide that it's uh, human readable as well. Uh, is there like tooling for that to display? Like say I have a serialized like object and I have my IPL that understands that object. Is there tooling where I combine those two and see I'm, what the data is? Or? I'm not positive. Okay. Uh, but like the, the human readable part of it is like, is your IPL syntax that I'm showing here okay. on, on the thing. So yeah, it's very much a, uh, in the in the binary data itself isn't that bad. I got to the point where I was putting these slides together where I could sight read it, mm -hmm. which is scary, <laughs> kind of, but um, it's not too bad. Cool. And then, uh, so I have run into ASM.1 through X509. Yep. Um, and I was kind of, so I, I, I did dealt with protobuf a lot before I discovered ASM.1, and I was kind of like shocked at the similarities between the two. Yep. Um, like. I, I did do a lot of research in ASM1 other than X509 stuff. Is there any reason why you would choose ASM1 over protobuf? Uh, so for why why you choose why you would choose ASM1 over over protobuf? Yeah, so I mean, I usually just default to choosing protobuf if I want a binary serialization with IBL. Yeah, you probably would want to choose protobuf cuz yeah. it's it's more widely supported and and the uh, and the in like as I see in further slides, right? The support in Go for ASM.1 uh, marshaling and unmarshaling isn't, it doesn't support the full feature set of, of language. They pretty much implemented enough to do the key exchange or crypto stuff for 509, right? Yeah. And then they kind of said, all right, we're done. And also the, uh, I, I would imagine the the performance characteristics of protobuf are probably a little bit better mm -hmm. than ASM.1 because they like, um, you know, since ASM.1 support is only used in a certain handful of areas in the Go ASM library, the run time, uh, the speed isn't very good, but the length of the encoded structures is very, uh, is very small. So that's one trade off you can make, you know, if you're willing to trade uh, CP time over, uh, over size, mm -hmm. but you know, with machines with, 32 gigs of RAM and infinite disk. I'm not sure if size is yeah. really a, a deal breaker anymore. Cool. Sweet. Um, so yeah, so some more IDL syntax and structure here. So uh, we can support enumerated and default fields. So you can say, hey, the color of this car, it only came in red, blue, and green, which is kind of weird, but it's the RPG color set. So we'll take it. Uh, fields can also be optional and have default values. Uh, and you can also, and you can specify ranges. So the the um, the range syntax for passengers, when we say it's an integer value, you can have one to seven, right? That's kind of like the Ruby syntax for specifying ranges, right? If I'm recalling my Ruby correctly from 15 years ago. Um, you can also give it the or syntax, you know, one or five or 10 or 20. So you can say uh, it's a t it, the value has to be one of these or it can be in, in, in this range, which is kind of nice, uh, helps narrow down what you're sending. Um, now the fun part and why we're all here is how is this encoded on the wire uh, when we're when we're sending data around. Uh, so ASM.1 supports a number of encoding flavors. There's burr, purr, zer, and dir. 
uh, the burr is the basic encoding rule, so it's a uh, standard TLV type length value kind of thing. Uh, anyone who's kind of had to write their own uh, protocol thing kind of probably implemented it like this. Hey, it's type this, it's of length this, and here's the data, and then wait till the next type length value thing. Um, it's burr is pretty. It's it defines enough so that you can serialize and deserialize your your structures appropriately. Um, it's a little bit wordy, or it can be a little wordy. Uh, that is packed encoding rule, uh, which it's great. Everything's optional, so eh, whatever. Um, but it's really hard to understand and implement. I was reading some of the documents around per encoding and it was a little rough. I'm not really sure how people grok that to even write an encoder for it or decoder for it. Um, there's XML encoding rules where it just serializes everything to an XML structure, which is, you know, why you'd want to take a, you know, you're definitely going to lose a lot of space savings by blowing it out to XML because you're going to end up with all kinds of tags over the place, but it's an option. And then there's the one that Go uses, which is the distinguish encoding rules. Uh, it's a uh, it's a subset of the basic encoding rule, which that allows for a single way. So anything in Burr that says you can do it this way or that way, and in, in, in distinguish they said you're going to do it this way, and then that's the way it shall be. In this, you know, kind of move on. Um, it always provides length encoding for structure for structures and fields. Um, and like I said, this is the one that um, Go uses. So the kind of the structure of each field in an encoded ASN at one type, it'll have a one byte type. And there's a whole listing of types in there uh, on the, in a spec that says, you know, this is an integer type, Boolean type, uh, custom type, all that kind of fun stuff. And then uh, for, so the type has, so the, the, the type information in that one byte has two bits for class. So whether it's a universal type, like an integer, Boolean, things like that, things are included in, in the language, right? Think of a built-in uh, type for Go. Uh, application defined, uh, private defined, and then context specific. I couldn't get a firm definition of what context specific was, um, but uh, I really don't know why it's there, but I'm sure there's reasons. Uh, and then there's one bit for form, whether it's primitive or constructive, uh, or, or constructive, so if it's a, if it's a Excuse me, if it's an integer, right, it'll be primitive because it's built in the language. But if it's a constructed type, like the garage or a car uh, I showed earlier, it'll be a it'll be uh, a, a constructed type. Then the remaining five bits are for a tag, uh, which is how you tell the receiver on the other end what type to marshal it back into again. So both sides have to be aware of the IDL structure. Both sides have to have the stubs to read and write the encoded structure, and then the five bits for the tag tells the receiver, this is really type foo, and then it then the then the, the deserializer will know how, uh, where to put the bits. Uh, the length we only have one byte for length, so we only have uh, you know two to the eight um, eight bits worth of storage to tell how long it is. So um, you can do short, long, or you can do indefinite length. Uh, Structures, the indefinite length structure just sets the length to zero and then you pad the end of the value with null bytes. And then that way uh, the, the serializer or deserializer can, can kind of uh, look for the, the two null bytes at the end of the value and then it knows where to stop and then it takes everything before it and, and creates a structure from it. So we're going to go through a little bit of an example here, which I use for both the gob and the ASN01. I needed something that had had um, strings and integers and other stuff in it, so I just did locations in waypoints. So uh, when I moved to Colorado, I drove from Philadelphia. So uh, a lot of waypoints that we stopped at on the way through. So I figured, eh, we'll do this. So we can see with um, ASN01, we, uh, so this is go, right? So we define our, our waypoint struct. We have a city, and since it's ASN01, we have to tell the marshaller what string type to encode in. Since we had the IA5 string, the um, the UTF-8 string, and then uh, we could do binary strings. I don't know why we want to do binary strings for the name of cities and states, but I'm telling it to do IA5 strings, which are a seven-bit ASCII from before. 
and then we have a lat latitude, longitude, and elevation, and a date time. So in ASN01, you can give it a, a um, UTC. There are our flavors for dates. Uh, UTC type, I believe, is very similar to RFC 3339 type dates, where it's like date, T, time, Z at the end, you know, for Zulu. So it's kind of like that nice, big, very, very specific date string. Um, and then for elevation, we, we can give it a, a default value of zero. Uh, we can always assume that we're at sea level um, in, in case a, a value is not specified, right? Um, the one interesting thing that I found writing this example up was um, the decimal support for Go, uh, for ASN that one and Go was lacking. So I had to do locations as a degree and then an exponent. So it's like, you know, the lat the latitude of Philadelphia is, you know, 39.9526. So I had to give it the whole number and then say give an exponent of negative four. That way we can put the decimal place in the right the decimal point in the right spot. Right. Um, this example is pretty straightforward. We just define the structure. You know, it has nested structures, so we have the waypoint, and inside the waypoint we have two instances of a location struct, which also have their own field, so it kind of has that whole nesting thing going on. Uh, in the main, we define a new, var, uh, a new var called Philly, and we populate it with all the magical stuff about Philadelphia. And then we ASN encode it. Um, so I just wrote that little function there um, that takes an interface type. And pretty much the so one, two, three, five, the handful of lines that are in the ASM encode function there are what it takes to uh, marshal a structure into ASM.1 binary encoding, right? So they, so just like JSON, right? You you say JSON that, dot marshal, right? If you include the JSON package and then you skip the struct and it just spews out JSON or XML or whatever other encoding you want to use. So everyone Got this? Yep. Uh, so, did you have to define like an IDL for this? No. So, does it generate that no. uh, based or it just doesn't need it? it? It doesn't need it, so. Traditionally, though, if you were doing like an ASM1, you would have an IDL. Full yeah, so if you're doing like a full system where you, know, you had a Go program talking to a Java program, talking to a Perl program, talking to a C program, you would have an, you'd have a common IDL and you have to generate things off of that. that I couldn't find an IDL compiler for uh, for Go, so I'm not sure that exists. Um, but you know, there are ones available for the, for other languages. That you so use. does that go to the previous thing that you mentioned, where Go doesn't really implement the full ASN.1, so it's just part of that? They implement enough to get the 509 stuff working, and then they kind of that's some guessing is they kind of just stopped, as we'll see by how the performance compares against other more wild, more widely used uh, encoding types. So here we go. So we're going to take that. I got, I got oh, sorry. Question on the last. Yeah. Um, so the, the time is uh, so the, the the struct tag on the time is says UTC, but you're saying that was just the format, and then but you specify the time in, in local. Local, so yes. Is that, so is that going to change the time, or is it? I I believe the UTC thing uh, in the in the struct tag on the ASN that one struct tag is for the format. Um, it's just the format. Yeah, I'm almost positive it, it, yeah. it's just for the format. I have notes, but that would break the presentation. So <laughs> I can confirm that after the talk's over. So the binary output, um, as we can see here, it's very straightforward, right? So beginning at the top left-hand side, you know, the uh, hex 30 is a type tag indicating a sequence. So these are all the type tags that are built into the ASM.1 spec, right? It says, hey, I have a sequence here. And then the 4B is the length of the remaining bytes in the struct. You know, so, so, so we have 75 bytes left. And then you know, type you know, 16, just kind of like walking our way through you know, byte by byte by byte uh, in, in the hex dump there. Uh, 16 is a type tag for IA5 string, and then the length of the IA5 string, and then beginning with 50, and then going to 61, we have the word Philadelphia in 7-bit ASCII. So uh, it's really, it's not a, as far as binary formats go, this one is really approachable uh, from 
my understanding, but then I also deal with video specs and audio specs all day long, so uh, this is really approachable compared to those things. Um, but as, uh, once you have a listing from the, the that one spec of what the built-in types are and then you know how you defined your own structures, being able to kind of walk your way through a hex dump of this is kind of nice. It's really easy to do. You just kind of just drag through it. Um, so we have the same sequence for the uh, state and country fields. They begin 61, 70, yeah, right in here. So we have another 16. Uh, my mouse pointer oh, is up there. So 16 begins another string, and then we have, you know, 02, a length of 2, and then 25, um, 50, 41, that's PA, right? So we have, you know, if you have your, if you have the listing out of all the built in ASM at one uh, type tags, and then you have your ASCII table memorized, you can just plow right through this, right? <laughs> so, uh, um, so yeah, that's and then we get down to the uh, the the time is at the very 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 end here, but we also have the uh, latitude and longitude are that are buried in here. We have another type thirty in this area, which defines other sequence of things, and then behind that we have the lat and long uh, that are also defined as um, that are in there. 08, 02, 03. Yep. Any questions on? this magic right here, no? All right, let's try to keep it, uh, I'll try to move on from now. So as we're getting into, as you saw on our previous example, we have uh, struct tags, like we have for, um, for, for JSON and XML, right, where we can say, we can give hints to the compiler saying, hey, these are the things that we want you to serialize to, uh, not, I mean, not compiler, like, uh, the marshaller, marshaller and a marshaller. Uh, we give them hints like we do in JSON and XML. Here are all the struct tags that we can use to give hint, hints to things. So, um, so it gets it back to that UTC tag here. Uh, UTC calls this time that time to be marshaled as an ASM.1 UTC time value. So the UTC time value is a struct that I believe is very similar, if not identical, to the RC 3339 uh, spec or yeah recommendation. Um, we have a whole bunch here for marshalling tags that we showed you before on the thing and then on the unmarshalling uh, side we can say um, you know since most folks who use language prefer sequences uh, we have to call out that is a set rather than a sequence so any, any compound structure like any struct that has things in it by default the Go ASN1 marshaller will, will encode it as a sequence rather than a set. You have to tell it otherwise. Um, and that's about it. I heard typing, so I imagine there's questions coming in. Oh, no. no, no, no. I'm answering questions. <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah, people had questions about some uh, things in Go. So sure, sure. Any, any questions on ASN1 before I move into Gob? No? All right. We're all sufficiently bored? Mm -hmm. cool. All right. <laughs> Moving on to Gob. So Gob, um, for has anyone worked with Gob before? Know what Gob is? All right. So Gob is the Go object binary format. So it's built into the language itself. It is a really neat way to binary encode. It's kind of like um, for those folks who uh, serve time in Java land. Uh, there's a the Java serialization format. What the hell is that thing called? It's been too long. Anyway. Is it called serialization? Pardon? Is it just called serialization? I think so, yeah, but there's a format. I know the binary format has a thing on it so that other JVMs can read it despite being in the reverse or whatever it is. I, it's, yeah, it's been too long or, or it's either been too long or it hasn't been long enough since I've done Java. It's been, it's been not long enough. Yeah. Um, I know Python has like pickle. Yeah, yeah, it has pickle. Yeah, exactly. So this is so Gob is like the is like the pickle for Python, right? It's the kind of like the binary format that's baked in language. You can just give it anything, and it'll just blast out binary, right? So it's really cool, and it's it's a first class citizen because it's built in the language, right? Uh, all go all go understands it. So it is a Go specific binary encoding. It is not language independent. There is a um, a very old 
uh, Python project on GitHub that claims to decode gob structures. Uh, I'm not sure if I would want to use that in a production environment, um, but if you want to uh, hack on some binary stuff in Python, I'm sure I'm sure that person would accept PRs. Uh, so there's no IDL to generate the interfaces and shims uh, and stubs because um, it's Go and it has access to everything. So you can just run reflection on it and it has access to the whole AST that you're defining and like all the other fun stuff. It knows exactly where all the things are so it can do all the things that it needs to do. So there's no IDL uh, on like Avro, flat buffers, protobufs and thrift, right? So you don't have to define a structure, you can just marshal it. Um, so, no, so there is a trade-off with, with uh, having without having an IDL. So uh, it, it, an IDL is nice because you can define, you can have that be your spec, right? If I'm implementing an API that's protobuf, that uses protobus, I implement the IDL, I broadcast the IDL to all my all, all my customers, and then they implement the IDL, and then we're we're cool, right? Um, but it also but it also tends to be like one more thing to do. So uh, you, you have to, you know, update my, uh, I want to update my, my ABI call. So redo the IDL, regenerate everything, implement the IDL uh, call, and make sure all of our consumers also get the updated IDL and generate their code to do the same thing. Um, they took a lot of lessons from uh, GA, uh, from uh, protocol buffers. So since Protobus was, was written by Google and Go was written by Google, uh, they kind of had the inside track on what kind of things went wrong or wish, things they wish they could have done differently in protocol buffers. So they did it, I don't know what they call it the right way, but they did it a better or different way in uh, Go with Gob. So, um, so protocol buffers have required fields in them, or you can mark fields as required, right? In GOB, there's no such thing as a required field. So that helps with um, CPU and memory overhead when encoding and decoding GOB structures, because um, the way protocol buffers has to do it, it has to have like a shadow structure that has the required fields in it, and then you have to map, you have to decode your structure in there and then map things over to it. So you end up with a, a, a bit higher of a memory footprint uh, compared to GOB. And, um, there's also no default values in GOB, so you can't say this is, like go back to the car example, you know, the default uh, color is red, right? You can't say that in GOB, unlike in protocol buffers, um, because of, uh, I don't know why, because of, um, but by default, instead of you having, being instead of having user specified default values, the GOB encoder will use the um, Golang defaults for that type instead. So if you have an integer value, an you know, integer value, it'll be just be a zero on there. So they kind of worked around certain things that they learned from protocol buffers in GOB. Um, also, the one neat thing about GOB that's different than protocol buffers is that if you want to send an array of integers uh, using protobufs, you have to create a bucket for it so that you can send an array of integers around. Whereas in GOB, you can just serialize an array of integers and just sh and then ship it out. So like you're like you're all good. So there's no sort of bucketing for it. Um, if you use Go RPC, uh, then you already use um, GOB. I I haven't heard of anybody using the Net RPC package yet, so who knows? Um, but it's there, and it uses GOB. Uh, ba, ba, ba. So GOB encoding uh, works just like the XML and JSON and ASN.1 examples, right? Uh, only exported fields. So if you have a you know a lowercase field in there, it's it's going to be a hidden value, right? It's a uh, you know just like we're all used to. Um, and since it's built into Go language and it uses reflection, there are no struct tags for GOB encoding. So you can just serialize anything you want, uh, which is kind of nice. You don't have to worry about you know, giving uh, hints or anything like that to the encoder or decoder. I have a question. Sure, yeah. Will it encode your struct tags as well? Encode your struct tags? Or is it relying on those struct tags to be part of the struct definition on the other end? So there are no struct tags for GOB encoding itself, but I mean, so if you had a, 
if so I guess if you had a structure that you could serialize with JSON or gob, would it include the JSON tags? In the yeah, if you, if you just had like an, so tags are just an arbitrary string, so yeah, 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 and it's kept around at runtime, so I can imagine an encoder would be able to access it if it wanted to send it as part of the binary format to the other end. But if the struct definition that doesn't yeah. have it, then I don't know. I don't know. That'd be an interesting thing to find out. That'd be that's an interesting takeaway. Oh, shit, I wish I had make it right down. Pardon? It wouldn't have anywhere to put them. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right because you can't dynamically create types and go. So you can't just like create a type and then Boom. Yeah, interesting. That's a good question though. I'll have to look into that because I like playing around with things like this. So it'd be fun. Um, so, so for encoding things, uh, so there are no struct tags. Um, it'll only include uh, fields that aren't, aren't zero values, right? So if you have a whole big struct and you only fill in a handful of fields, it's only going to send those fields across because the receiver, by virtue of the fact that it's gob, is a Go look pro program. It knows what the zero values are for the types that you, for the fields that you didn't encode, right? So it, it just it fills them in magically, right? By using the Go runtime. That's kind of like the, the, the secret sauce to gob. Yes? So I, I would assume that it also would preserve uh, the difference between a nil slice versus an empty slice. I would imagine so, yes. Yeah. I haven't dug that deep into this, okay. but that's another great question okay. that I really want to find out the answer to now. <laughs> um, you can't encode channels, nor can you uh, encode functions. So, if you, uh, so if you really can't, yeah, you can't pass a closure or a gob and then have it do something, then have it call back that, although that would be really interesting. I'm not sure what the, what the value prop on that one is. Um, it actually uses a pretty similar encoding to ASN.1, uh, the whole type length value thing that we went through, where you have a type of a certain specified fixed length and the value of a certain uh, uh, length, and then you have the value afterward. Um, and this is where we kind of get into some really neat stuff here. Uh, so with protocol buffers and Thrift and Avro and all of uh, you know fun stuff, is that each side knows what the structure looks like, and that's kind of like how it, how that all works. With gob, since you can send a, a structure of type A to a machine that only knows about type B, but they're similar enough that you can force type A into it, into type B, right? Um, you don't need, neither side needs to know about the type that's being encoded because gob will serialize a high level version of what the receiving structure should look like. So I'm not sure if that made sense. But we're gonna get there. So it's it's a uh, self-describing. So that last bullet point: the first time a type is encoded, the encoder will include a description of the type using sort of uh, a loose spec that they have built into the language. As far as these things, much like ASIN that one, these things, these values mean that it's an integer string versus other data types. And the Go runtime knows how to parse. That, that binary description. So it's a, it's a structure that describes a structure, is what it is. And it, it, it only include, in, it includes all, um, all primitive types too. I have a question. Sure. <laughs> so it encodes the type information uh, inbound or in, in band yep. so that uh, you can have that with the objects. So I imagine that's for persistence in case like your code goes away and you need to read this object. Um, Again, yeah. So yeah. That, that's part of it, yes. Okay, so if I have a program and it doesn't know the structure of the thing that I'm reading, um, like how does it, because normally you like unmarshal a object into an existing structure. Yeah. So how would you discover what the structure is to put that in your code to then... So the god decoder on, on the receiving end knows enough about the types that is getting from that built-in encoded uh, type to know what to decode it into and it'll create it. So even though you don't have the type statically defined in your source code, it can like create the type or... I believe it would just be like an interface. Type. Yeah, the interface, I believe so. Uh, as yeah, I'll, I'll have to go through and run some more examples of this. I have better notes too that are not in PowerPoint, unfortunately. But yeah, like the source and destination structs don't have to be identical. 
like they have to be similar enough. So if you have a structure that defines five types on one end, and then your receiver has has seven, you know, uh, your sender has five member variables in the struct, and then your receiver has seven or eight or or that, it'll it'll just fill in the gaps and then leave the other ones empty. So like, as long as they can, as, as long as they're close enough. So for like a JSON, um, if you you can take the JSON and you can serialize or deserialize that into uh, MSI, right? And, and uh, is there something like MS, MSI? Uh, oh. Map stream of oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe that's the case here okay. with Gob, yeah. yeah. I want to take a deeper dive into Gob because it got really interesting and I didn't have the bandwidth to do it before I get to the first time and then, of course, I didn't have the bandwidth to do it again, so. Um, so gob will match fields based on the name of, of the field and the compatible type of it. So if you have an uh, if you have a structure on one end that has a you know int in it and the other side has a un64 in it, like those match up as long as the name name and, and, and value are in the same family, right? So the the encoding of numerical types is done in a sizeless way. So if your sender has a un8 versus an int32 versus a un64, but you have a number in there that'll fit in a 8-bit integer, it, it'll serialize it all as an int or a uint and then ship it across. Um, we yes. had a question from the sure, sure. Slack. Um, how does Go make sure that you don't lose information during the translation? I'm not sure what that was in reference to, but. Interesting. Oh, um, if you decode something, so if you have, um, the, if the decoder has a value that is too big for what it thinks the data type is, it'll throw an error. Okay. So if you have, so if you give it a, you know, two to the 64 minus one, right, and you pass it over the wire and your receiver doesn't have the in 64 or you in 64 type in it, it'll just kick back an error saying, hey, I can't decode this because it, it, it won't fit. We're trying to fit a big number into a small bucket. But um, if, you, if you have a field that's like, if you're encoding a struct and then you're decoding that into another struct that is missing a field, that, like JSON, I would assume that that's not, that's not an error, right? I don't believe so. Yeah. So I, I, think, the yeah, I think you're right. The specific value of the field can't fit in the destination struct. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, like, not undefined, but open to interpretation kind yeah. of things. And, and there's no real gob like spec. Like there's, there's kind of like the package documentation, which is a loose spec, but there's no, like in my day job, right? I'm used to looking at specs and define very specifically what the bit stream layout of things are, but for God, there isn't that whole cool thing and like the mapping back and forth isn't as defined as I would like it to be sometimes, so. But it's, it also sounds like it's more liberal like the type. It is, yeah, it's, yeah. it's yeah, and it goes back to the whole point of the sender and receiver don't have to share an IDL, so they don't have to be the exact same type. As long as they're close enough, the the decoder will do its best effort to make sure all the data gets, gets pulled into a struct on, on the receiving side. Um, I had a, another question. Sure, sure. So, uh, does, so most of the encoding packages in Go ignore like private fields. Um, does GOB do that? Because I imagine like one use case might be like I have an object over here in this machine and I just want to get it over the machine and persist all the state. Yeah. Does yeah. GOB persist all the state or does so, GOB really? So GOB only does exported fields. So so yeah, I mean it's the same as JSON and XML. So yeah, if you want if you don't want to have anything if you want to have stuff that you want to keep secret on your side, you just make it you know, make it lowercase and, and then you're and then you're all good. Um, and like the GOB the God byte stream when you serialize things has since it includes that um, it includes a serialization it includes a gob encoded version of the struct that it would like to decode into as like the preamble of the bit stream and then it includes like uh, the actual encoded data afterward the whole bit stream can be read it can be read all by um, it, it's a, a self describing you know kind of bit stream right where it'll um, it'll describe the structure that It'll describe the structure that it wants to be decoded into, and then it includes all the encoded data afterwards. So, and that's kind of important when we get 
couple of slides in. How many more slides? Yeah, a couple more slides in. Uh, another example using the same things. This example is longer because Gob has this whole notion of uh, you have to register your structure and then you create like a, uh, I keep wanting to call it a session, but it's not really a session, but it could be a session. So when you encode uh, something the first time, it does the whole big thing, right? Uh, of the of a serializing a gob encoder struct of what the thing is and then the data afterward. Um, but if you're serializing an array or a slice of the same type of, of struct, so if we're serializing you know, a slice of waypoints, right? That gob encoder structure of, that gob encoder structure of itself, like the kind of meta structure, um, is only coded once. And then after that, the actual encoding of the individual um, bars is very small. So you only take that hit once at the beginning of each session. And then after that, um, you're good. So if you have a big array of large data structures, you can, amortize that hit across the entire array and then it becomes very small. Or if you're only encoding a couple of things at a time, you're gonna take that big penalty up front and that's gonna not be so good. Um, that's kind of a downside compared to things like protobufs and, and scripts and Avro and things like that where, you know, since both sides know what to expect, you don't have to encode all this, you know, tribal knowledge in there, right? You can just send the data across and they go, hey, I don't have to do with it. Um, but since God allows you for that flexibility, you kind of have to suffer the downsides of it, which is, you know, trade-offs, right? Yeah, um, has like a reflection. Yeah. A capability where it can describe itself. Yep. So if you needed to transmit it like in, in band, then you can't. That's probably a lot like what Go, uh, you know, like, like, like what God has. So, um, so you need to register the struct before encoding it, and that's on this uh, line here. God that register, you know, you just give it the type. And then that that tells the encoder to create um, in the documentation it's called the wire type, not like the meta type or whatever it is. It's the wire type, so that's the uh, gob encoder structure uh, that it's going to send. Uh, any questions here? The code is a little bit more. I hate to use the word verbose because it's only you know, like eight lines, but you do have to register. <laughs> <laughs> your type with the God encoder, and then you can use it. Unlike JSON and, and uh, XML, where you can just kind of just blast it through the encoder. So, uh, so you don't put that on the, the encoder itself. It's just kind of a global, globally registered thing, right? Yeah, it's, it, it, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's registered as a type that the God encoder can now use. Yeah. Uh, so when it sees things of that type, it, it knows how to. It, it knows what uh, wire type to you know, throw in the wire. So the ASN dot one tags that are still on the the waypoint struct, you don't need them anymore, right? No, no, no. Like this is just, uh, yeah, exactly. I just use the same code for all the examples to kind of have a little bit of continuity. Yeah. So here's the gob encoder structure. So the highlighted part is the wire type. So that is all the stuff that the gob encoder put down before it even wrote any data that you cared about. <laughs> And then the code, then the data that we cared about begins with the 4A, the 4A FF down at the bottom there on the, uh, on the byte like what 178 or 180 or whatever that is. Um, so yeah, and then the, uh, the, the 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 description of the of the um, of the values that were sending across that that whole waypoint structure begins with the FF. Um, and so is what happens is when Gob encodes. Uh, encodes a structure is that it assigns a a value it assigns a number a numerical value on on your side and then when that wire type is decoded on the other side before the actual value is is, uh, is decoded into that wire type the runtime will assign a value and then that value is passed over to the receiver and then when that wire type is decoded it's assigned the value that it was given in the wire type so here we can see that uh, FF is the value that of this wire type, so 255. And now, whenever you serialize on the sending side, this value, it'll always be type 255, as long as that GOB structure is still registered. And then on the receiver side, 
the runtime will take that wire type, decode it, uh, find a matching structure on the receiving side, and then it'll always reference that as 255 so that when the receiver gets another thing of type 255, it doesn't have to do all the work of decoding the wire type and finding a match and then decoding the data again. It just pulls a reference. So it's kind of sweet like that. Um, so yeah, so we're sending a lot of data, uh, you know, 180 bytes roughly of stuff before we send our actual data. Um, so yeah, it's 100, 179 bytes and then the actual data is only 75 bytes. But the nice thing is that if we were sending uh, an array of a thousand of these things, we take that hit of 179 bytes once and then after that we have however many instances of, of only 75 bytes or whatever the encoder structure is. So does that make sense to everybody? Cool, all right. I love talking about binary stuff, it's, it's great. Yeah. Uh, so the binary output here, I didn't, since there's really, I mean, no spec in the way I like to refer to specs uh, for GOB encoding, you kind of have to go through the documentation and you know kind of figure things out on your own. Um, but uh, kind of get back to that whole type length value encoding thing. So this is the data that we sent across. So this is not the wire type. This is the type that uh, we sent for the waypoint, right? Um, so the highlighted hex numbers are the lengths of the field. So you know, uh, B is 11, right? So it gives me the name Westminster, which is where we ended up when I moved here. And then two gives me the four three for uh, for Colorado, and then the uh, <coughs> zero D gives me thirteen for the United States, and then there's there's a whole bunch of more data encoded in there that I didn't uh, get a chance to dig through the documentation and, and find. Um, so it's zero zero one is string. Yeah, uh, it's the length. So zero one being more each length. Yeah, so zero one is a string type. Yeah, there are. A handful of, of, you know, much like an ASN one, you had the, you had the, uh, what term did they use for it? Like built-in, you know, types, like, you know, like, like your primitive values, right? And they're all assigned a, a numerical type that is easily referenced on the, on the uh, decoding side. You know, GOP does the same thing. So yeah, more binary. Uh, and next slide is. Here we get to the lovely trade-off portion of our, of our program here, where we talk about the uh, encoding and decoding of single structs and then arrays of structs using our, our friends JSON, XML, ASN.1, and Go. So as you can see, you know, JSON performs very, very well, right? Uh, we have quite low nanoseconds per op, but GOB is faster by a non-trivial amount. Um, GOB does have that overhead when you encode a single struct, right? You know, the whole, uh, the output size is 200, 253 bytes, um, only 74 of which are the actual data that we, that we care about. Um, but, um, you know, JSON is a little bit more efficient, you know, 208 bytes, XML, of course, our friend XML is very verbose. Um, so that's why it's 312 bytes. Um, and uh, ASN.1 is the clear winner as far as, uh, uh, as encoding size if you, you're willing to pay the penalty of 6,800 nanoseconds per op for encoding a little tiny structure that has a handful of numbers and strings in it. <laughs> so, but if you're looking for that uh, bytes on the wire, uh, performance, ASN.1 is, is, your, is your, your friend. Uh, you might just burn a whole CPU getting there. Um, Did you compare to uh, protobuffer thrift or anything? No, I should have. I should have, yeah. Oh, believe me, the, the list of things I wanted to do for this talk was <laughs> a mile long, of course, you know. We all dream big and then, you know, time hits and life hits. So, yeah. But, yeah, it, it would be an interesting thing to compare, you know, Thrift and Avro and Protobuf and things like that, right? Um, since those are true binary encodings, right? You know, we're encoding here. ASN.1 and GOB are the only two binary encodings on this list. You know, JSON and XML are, 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 are textual. But, you know, since we're all familiar with them, we can kind of get an idea of, 
you know, encoding like that waypoint struct into JSON, you know, 208 bytes versus the ASN01 is, you know, not, is just a little bit more than a quarter of that size, right? Or, uh, you know, or no, a third of that size. So, I mean, there's trade offs there. And of course, you know, that's what our, our, our jobs are as, as engineers is, is acknowledging the trade offs and making those, those decisions. Seems like a, each one of those has like a trade off. Yep. Except for <laughs> XML, which is just bad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's no clear winner here, but there is one clear loser. So, <laughs> so yes. Now, as someone who wrote Java for 16 years, I am very happy to have XML be out of my life. So, <laughs> yes. uh, so yeah. It's a, uh, there's a XML thing that you had in your slide for ASN1. Is that used like, um, commonly? Or? I don't. I, I had. I never saw it. Yeah. I mean, it's like it's part of the spec, right? Or it's part of the things that they acknowledge. Like, hey, here are all the ways that you can encode or serialize, and then they serialize it's another one. And I imagine XML makes makes it good for when you want to display things to a user, like on a UI, where you can kind of have that whole kind of structured thing going on. But like, I I kind of think of any sort of reason why you want to use XML encoded ASN01 because I mean. As you can see in the table here, a, a, a straight DER encoded struct is only 77 bytes, and then if you do the XML version of that, you know, you're looking at 312, and then the ASN01 version probably bigger because you have namespacing and extra stuff in there, so you're probably looking at more more bytes for having ASN, ASN encoded XML. So, yeah, I'm just really interested that the performance of the ASN, ASN1 encoder is so bad, you know, it's by far the slowest, although mm -hmm. XML is not that far behind it, I guess, but it's just interesting. And, 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 and of course, GOB is fast, and GOB is, is what I'd like to do is see how GOB has kind of pro, you know, progressed performance-wise from go like 1.0 up to now, because it uses re reflection very heavily, and reflection is slow, but it's gotten a lot better in Go since the really early days. So I, I'd imagine that the GOB numbers for encoding and decoding have gone from a very high level to a very low level. I just haven't seen the data myself. That's just a, a thought. And any questions on this? This is my last content slide. I have the thing to make the recruiters happy on, on the next slide. So we're hiring. <laughs> so Cloud DVR what we call a time-shifted video, so. Is, uh, is this on the um, PowerPoint slides for the Boulder, Denver uh, job postings? I don't think so. Do you want to shoot uh, Jason? I know Comcast Viper is on there. I don't oh, know what yeah. DVR specifically is. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if, if you have the Comcast you know, Viper drives, yeah. this, this is probably one of them. Like, this record's been open forever, so. Okay. Cool. Uh, but yeah. And uh, I have references for all the things I use. There was this great talk. The one YouTube link was this like really like 90s video of like this French guy talking about ASN01. It was amazing. I watched it. It took me like three hours to watch it. I was just kept pausing and taking notes. It was wonderful. So that's all she wrote from my side. Awesome. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Awesome. So I forgot to mention our uh, talk next month will be a gentleman by the name of Mike Lloyd. He's a pivot here. He used to work for Amazon for AWS Lambda, and he will be giving a talk on uh, Go on Windows. So if you're interested in Windows, that might be when you want to attend. Uh, but yeah. Or if you're interested in, I guess, probably just being more compatible with Windows. Yeah, uh, that's something that one of our teams is running through right now is we have a C program that we integrate Go into, and the Go can cross compile for Windows, but the C part is uh, kind of throw off. <laughs> so yeah, if you're interested in that stuff, uh, Mike will be talking about that next month. Uh, the So next week is the Denver Go Meetup. So if any of you folks are close to Denver, the talk will be on metaprogramming in Go, which should be really interesting. So, uh, and that will be live streamed and posted on YouTube as well. So yeah, that's uh, it. Uh, that's all I got. Uh, feel free to grab some food and uh, hang out and chat for a little bit. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, Thank you. Bags, please take food. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I'm gonna unplug. Is that a good yeah. All right. Cool. Thanks.
I think I know Mike. Did he? I think he used to work for Comcast for a while. Then he went to. Then he went to Amazon. Oh, really? Now he's back again. I didn't know that. Yeah. Interesting.